job we had as physiotherapists were to treat any physical illness, illnesses, so any physical problems like sprained ankles, sore backs, or self-inflicted injuries like wrist damage or neck damage if people had attempted suicides, and or fractured oscalsis if they'd been silly enough to want to jump off a bridge or a building. In other words, we saw a lot of people with failed suicide attempts who had injuries of different sorts. We saw injuries or illnesses like what was actually called a psychiatric hand and that was when people were very very tense and they would hold usually only one hand in such a tight grip that it would get contractures and the problem was to get those hands open to wash them because as you know when you've had plaster on a hand or something like that for a long time the smell of skin which has not been exposed to air or water for a long time is very offensive and so our job would be to get these patients to relax and open these um, these tight hand this tight hand grip. Um, so that, that was a nasty condition that we would sometimes see. Sometimes people would be totally mute and or catatonic and we would be asked to treat them with passive movements uh, and stimulus to um, get, get them to, to move or to, to respond to sensation. And so we would use massage, we would use percussion type massage and passive movements for these people. Those often were people in more the more acute areas, the ones with the with the psychiatric hand, uh, for want of a better description of it, the people who were mute and catatonic. I guess the thing that was so important is that one learned to recognize that when these people who had been mentally unwell became well, they were such special people. When they were unwell, they could be awful, but you knew it was their illness. And the thing that I think that I always loved about my patients there, because I truly did and thoroughly enjoy working with them and have an absolute well, sense of, of love for them, a sense of warmth and protection for them, um, was that you knew when they got better they would have a depth of understanding and knowledge that I think only going through the hell that they went through gave them a special, special people. And I really have a great respect for people. When I talk to students about psychiatric illness now, I always use the example of somebody with a psychiatric illness if if they if somebody is a physiotherapist is treating somebody who is um, maybe odd or difficult and so on, and they're perhaps psychiatrically ill. Imagine they're really carrying a Father Christmas sized sack of difficulty on their back. And they are trying to walk normally and lead a normal life in spite of this colossal burden that nobody else can see, but it's within them. And they struggle to go forward. And for that, you have to admire them because they mightn't be doing very well, but they're still doing their absolute best. And uh, that was the feeling I had about these patients, so it was great to be able to help them. But we would do exercises, would be exercise classes, um, which the patients hated and weren't really very effective, but we would do a ward exercise class in a lot of wards regularly. Later that mutated into going for a walk which got them outside and we tried to make a walk or some outside activity a normal part of daily life for them. Um, we taught a lot of relaxation classes and so we would two or three times a week go to different, often, to, often in each ward there would be two or three relaxation classes in a week where you would sometimes ask the patients to lie on the floor on mats, sometimes you would ask them just to sit in chairs, but you would talk to them about recognizing their muscle tension and turning it off in various ways. So sometimes it would be a Jacobson type re tightness, letting go, contrast, relaxation. Sometimes it would be a um, Laura Mitchell sort of relaxation where you would ask the patient to recognize the spaces around their bodies and to sit or lie with and recognize 
that if they held their elbows close to their side, there would be a tension. If they let there be a space between their elbows and their body, they could feel that relaxation of their shoulders and their arms that comes with letting that space be. So you would talk to them about the space behind their knees, in front of their ankles, um, between their knees, in front of their hips, the hollow of their back as they were lying down and how as they relaxed more it flattened closer to the floor. Uh, those sort of things. I always liked the autogenic relaxation and developed my own version of it where I would ask people um, to first of all listen to noises outside the building and dis um, dismiss them because they were not important or a threat, listen to noises that were closer in the building or in the room, dismiss those because they weren't a threat or a challenge and then focus on noises within themselves um, and dismiss those because they also weren't a threat or necessarily real and then focus on letting their whole body limb by limb get heavier and warmer against the mat or if they were sitting just in the chair. I always feel that's a really good relaxation for people who can't sleep because as it goes through you then focus on the breathing which is slow and gentle and I like to use the phrase in that always as people breathe out my breathing calms me and so they're using their breathing and almost a mantra my breathing calms me as they're relaxing. Uh, what else do we do? Those are the relaxations sometimes they were more active but mostly sitting and recognizing that. And sometimes they would find you would do what I would call a potpourri of relaxations. You would find that you were watching somebody lying or sitting in the relaxation group and you knew you had started with an autogenic but that patient needed to feel more so you would move to a contrast and then back to the autogenic because you were always watching the patients. The thing that we physiotherapists have over everybody else I think in teaching relaxation is our knowledge of movement, muscles and just that absolute awareness of what the body is doing and a much better recognition of body language I think than some of the other staff and I think that's why we manage to take much more effective relaxations than other people. We introduced some touch programs where we would get people to learn to accept touch from others because very often people in a psychiatric hospital are there because life has not been easy for them and sometimes some of their anxieties or state of mind is based on the fact that the only touch they've ever known has been either has been offensive or inappropriate and uh, so to be touched takes a, a big learning curve for a lot of people and we would do a, sometimes touch programs where we would get people who would accept each other to do things like sort of raindrops on their backs or um, different different touch, different movements um, to each other in a, in a safe environment. But as physiotherapists we were the people who could touch but and teach people that there could be touch that was not um, sexual, not straight clinical like the doctor examining them but empathetic but, um, but not offensive. We had a big role I think in helping people learn to accept touch and a very big responsibility to do that mindfully, carefully and always with the patient's full permission and with the warning to the patient that if anything I do is in any way offensive or distressing to you, you are the authority you only have to say stop and I will stop because so often they had experienced touch when they might have said stop and things hadn't stopped so that was very important. We used and again it was Molly Andre who taught us all this to do a what we called a blanket massage. Molly taught us to get the patient to lie on their tummy on the bed they're usually in just their brown pants or underpants if it was a man. 
we would cover the patient entirely with a blanket, a woolen blanket, and we would tuck it right in under their shoulders as they lay on, lay on their tum. Uh, so the blanket was right in under their shoulders so it wouldn't slide down. And then we would start by stroking that patient from their shoulders just down to their waist. Always a, a movement rather like stroking a cat. And you would explain it to the patient before you started. I remember I had one very, very anxious young man to treat and his name was Andrew. And we had all of us tried different ways to teach Andrew to relax and control his anxiety. So on this day, I had decided as a last resort that I would try a blanket massage on Andrew. So I got him to lie on the, I, I, showed, I told him what I was going to do. And to demonstrate to Andrew, I laid pillows out on the bed in the shape of a body and I covered the pillows with a blanket and I said Andrew this is what I'm going to do over the top of the blanket I am going to stroke just down to your waist and then if you're acceptable with that I'm going to stroke all the way down your body to the tips of your toes and I demonstrated on the pillows over the blanket how I was going to gently stroke his body like that and Andrew who stammered very badly stepped back towards the door and looked at me in horror and stammered out at me, but, 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 I'm not into that sort of vice. <laughs> I couldn't get home to tell my husband about it fast enough. <laughs> but when you did this massage, not to Andrew, but to other people, I felt it was terribly important to recognize how much sensation and empathy was transmitted through your hands because if you just stroked casually and let your mind think about what you were going to have for tea what you're going to do at the weekend or what had happened yesterday I'm quite sure that that transmitted to the patient so this blanket massage was very powerful means of communicating the patient had a blanket over the top of them so they were separated from you but you would stroke gently from their shoulders all the way down to their toes. And the other thing I used to think was very important because we tried it on each other was that if you stroked from the shoulders over the buttocks and right down to the toes as you got to the toes it, you had to stop positively. If you floated off it was left as an incomplete sensation so this Focusing on what you d were doing, really empathizing and relating to the patient with every movement of your hands, I thought was terribly important. And I remember treating a young lass with severe anorexia, and her anorexia had developed because she had been very abused by a family member, and if she was under a certain weight, this person would not touch her. So it was her goal always to be extraordinarily skinny so that she would not be at risk. And she, she was said to me that she walked around, she is so dissociated from her body, she described herself as walking ahead, walking around five feet above the ground. She ignored and totally shut out all physical sensations. She talked about the fact that even, she got grossly and dreadfully badly constipated, um, but she said if she had any body sensations, even the urge to go to the toilet, she would just dismiss it and she would not react to any body sensations. She ignored them. So we used body massage for her and she loved it. And she's one patient that I use body, uh, body mas blanket massage with often for quite a long time and we did it from the front as well in time with her but she would say that always she dissociated her body but after a blanket massage she would be aware of her body at first she said for an hour or two and after we'd done it and we did it on probably every twice a week for about six months by the end of that time when I finally discharged her um, she said she was actually being aware of her body from one treatment to the other and uh, so it was a way of making her aware and because of her um, because of her condition it was after quite a long time we did it to the front as well which was tremendously challenging for her but always she was covered by the blanket 
and sometimes you'd start to include the head as well as the part that was covered with the blanket. But always I would tell the patients what I was doing and if I was coming to the end of the time I would say to them this will be the last stroke so they knew that I was coming to the end of that treatment. Tremendously simply powerful, simple type of treatment but extraordinarily powerful. Thank you.